Between April and July, a temporary lull prevailed. The Russians, whose offensive had stalled, expected the Germans to be the first to move into the summer offensive. However, it took the Germans three months to gather the necessary reserves. With von Riel, I was on the road on a cold May morning. As we descended the slope, the forests and villages that had been our landmarks disappeared, only to reappear over the crest of the hill when the horses were on its opposite slope. Then the sense of breath reappeared. We are always in the center of this vast landscape. The saddle creaks. You feel the warmth of the horse between your legs. Your eyes wander aimlessly. After an hour's ride, we see a church whose dome ends in a round poppy, towering over the whole farmstead. It was like this in Sysov, once the country estate of a Russian prince, later the estate of my companion's great-uncle. Some of the stalls were still standing. The plaster was crumbling from the walls, but they were massive and wide and built of stone, witnesses of former prosperity. Nothing had been done since then. The erection of an ugly concrete shed was all the state farm administration had done to modernize the farmstead. Then the war came upon it all. But what an estate it once was. The ruins of two dozen large buildings, not counting the wooden houses, were scattered over a hundred and twenty acres. Between the stables and farm buildings, the road led upward to a house that stood at the south end of the park property. It was a one-story building. Even today the remains of the stately walls formed a semicircle around a lawn with an avenue of young lime trees. Directly in front of it stood the guest house. To the east, a narrow street twisted between small houses to the church that belonged to the property. It stood at the edge of the grounds, so that there was no view into the distance, and one found peace in certainty and shelter. On his first visit von R. had already found an old man who remembered his great uncle. Ah, the old days, sir. Barefooted children greeted us, girls laughed. Men took a break from their work. Hello, the old men said. The young one smiled at us and said, Good morning. We drove excitedly through the park, down the main avenue leading from the house to the Dnieper Plain. Old trees framed it, forming a dark tunnel that opened only far below into sun-drenched fields. To the right and left, berry bushes and lawns peeked out between the trees, surrounded by weather-beaten oaks, firs, limes, and pines. The air moved in gentle waves, insects buzzed, and birds fluttered about, chirping animatedly. Sweet peas, buttercups, nettles and windflowers bloomed along the winding trails. The air was still. Mosquitoes squeaked around in the thicket. And yet, amidst all the lush vegetation, one could feel the master hand of the man who had once owned the place. Once again we stood on a high hill, the horses' heads resting on our shoulders as we watched the clouds drift over the sun-drenched countryside. Will it be that God will give us back the land so that we can work it again? What a busy few days these have been. Yesterday, with short intervals, I was on horseback from half-past two to half-past ten in the evening. First was in the echelon to look after the horses and check on the work. Then in no two area to see if the lettuce was ready for cutting and how the radishes would be distributed. I also needed to organize the salad distribution today and see if the civilians were being compensated with food as I had instructed. Finally, I needed to talk to my man there about a very difficult problem in his personal life. I returned here to assess the results of my visit and spent half an hour over a cup of coffee with Bet. Then I rode with one of our supervisors, a theologian, to a field movie. It was walking and riding, walking and riding again. Ten minutes before the session began, I jumped off my steaming horse and said hello by the hand to Haney Stubing, who took seats for us. The hut was crowded to capacity. Two minutes later the general sat down beside me. I was greeted by my tomboy boys. I let them pass. They walked seven kilometers and, following my advice, slipped in without tickets. Back with rumbling bellies, walking, trotting, galloping. Don't fall, little horse. Dusk descended, suspicious fiddling, a broken telephone wire. We kept moving back and forth over the terrain. Crackle, rumble, boom, an anti-tank gun. Machine guns, 
the music of the front line, guns in the night, hushed animals, sentries standing at full height, propping up the bright sky. We galloped on, down a country road, then a bridge. Wren's ears perked up, and we were already at the stables. My orderly came running, recognizing the pounding of my horse's hooves in the night. It was the winter of 1941. Captain G was riding in front of the battery. It was very cold. He went into the house to warm himself. It's cold, he said, rubbing his hands together. You can speak German, replied a woman who came up to him from a dark room. They began to talk. She said she had worked on an estate in Holstein for five years. But how can you live here with one bed, three pots, a couple of forks and a knife, now that you know how they live in Germany? We live, after all, replied the woman. The other day we were in the standing room only room. All good. Do you want to see the pictures? Come here, I'll show you some pictures, said my companion. Olga immediately came over. She wanted to know more about this curiosity exciting Germany of which she had heard so much. Look, this is my daughter. She is now seven months old, explained my companion. Good, said Olga, her womanly love of children making her thaw for a moment. But it's not the same baby, she said suddenly, taking another picture. This one is much bigger than the first. But Olga, said my comrade, the second picture was taken at a closer distance. Don't you see that? She looked at him doubtfully, shaking her head a little and scrutinizing the photo again. Is that your wife? Sweetheart, she said critically. And that's not her here, she remarked, taking the next photo. Why this? No, laughed Olga. You're trying to play a trick on me. She has a completely different purse in this picture. You see, you've made a mistake. She listened doubtfully to his explanation. She couldn't believe it. We looked at the girl thoughtfully. Then we looked around, examining the hut, this room of the Russian peasant woman, which had once been dark and musty, but now, thanks to the German soldiers, had been transformed into a clean room and we knew that we still had a long journey ahead of us. We were in the echelon inspecting the equipment. The battery commander was inspecting the mercenaries. Where is your tunic, Alexei? At the tailor's, sir. Go and fetch it. Alexei turned around youthfully and disappeared like lightning. He returned a moment later, clicked his heels, and held his breath. It didn't give away the fact that he had rushed as hard as he could before. Alexei is an enthusiastic soldier. He has sewn a cockade on his cap. His honor would be deeply hurt if we made him take it off. He wears his uniform in his own manner, but wears it with the pride of a child. He wears a trouser belt and has pushed down the top of the shank of his boots so that the leather lies harmonized around his ankles. He wears his spurs high in the Cossack manner. It is difficult to dissuade him from doing so. Even an ill-fitting tunic and pants cannot hide the flexibility of his stance. He's not simple. When he returned from taking the oath, he said, I will not stay long with the battery. I'm going to Vlasov. You'll see. I'll be there. Two more villages later we met Grigory. He was fourteen years old. He had been picked up while wandering at the head of two women with two children. He came to the battery commander's headquarters as if we were his old friends. Where are you going? Home, sir, to Nikitino. He took off his cartouch, exposing a mop of blonde hair. Clear eyes laughed in a pure boyish face. Documenti. Here. He put the papers down and stepped back, in wary and tense anticipation as we examined them. Here it was, all quite correct. Grigory B. and mother Luba B. and daughter Maria. Valia S. and child are following from the hospital in Smolensk to Nikitino. Grigory stood in front, the others behind him. Calm down, mother, he said as the woman behind him rushed forward. He did not turn around, but merely made an impatient sign with his hand. The mother's eyes expressed a great sense of pride in her son. All right, he asked, and it sounded like it couldn't have been otherwise. All right. Grigory, the officer nodded. Cigarette. Then the tension fell from his face for a moment. 
His eyes brightened, and he leaned over the officer's shoulders to take a light from the battery commander. He stepped back and took a drag on his cigarette like a man dying of thirst. Then he began to speak. His answers followed quickly, and to questions of a personal nature which we asked he answered frankly. Then he said, well, and touched his car touch, full of the dignity of confiding conversation as man to man, and left the room to take up the space reserved for him. It looked funny and boyish the expression which his face had acquired. But Grigori, as a man, had already sent the women forward. Remembering his duties, he returned. Don't we have some potatoes for them? Yes, he could take some. How about some bread? Not so easy with that, he was told. He did not express displeasure, as they sometimes do in this country. He did not tell us a long story of their sufferings. He just looked at us and said, 200 grams. 200 grams. That meant, Master, you know we have nothing to eat, don't you? I know there's a war going on, but I'm not asking a lot for five people. We're used to a hard life. It's not our fault we have nothing to eat. Is it worth saying that he got his bread, and that the battery commander cut it off, taking it from his ration? Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. I cannot help remembering how often in the first summer of the war we met with pure-hearted hospitality from Russian peasants, how even without request they set before us their modest refreshments, because we came to them tired and exhausted from thirst and the burning sun. I recall numerous instances in which modest friendliness was answered with silent devotion. I saw again the tears on the woman's weary face that expressed the severity of her suffering when I gave her child a candy bar. I felt my grandmother's aged hand on my hair as she received me, the first terrible soldier, with many bows and an old-fashioned hand-kissing. How her heart overflowed with joy that I liked her food and told her it was delicious. And again, I remember the man who was so proud to receive us, on the day when we fell far behind our battery with our weary horses and took shelter from a thunderstorm in a village off the main road. He looked after the horses and distributed us to the best families in the village for dinner, all because he had once had the privilege of spending four years as a prisoner of war in Germany. He told us about his youth. In Siberia, he said, the peasants leave their houses unlocked, even if they are working in the fields, and there is always bread and salt on the table for anyone who follows by. In the evening, there is always food on the windowsill for fugitive convicts returning home. He drank and sang wistful songs. All these people are homesick. One must watch them thus for an hour to learn what respect and devotion they are capable of, and to feel the mental simplicity from which all their actions spring. They help so naturally and devotedly that one never ceases to be amazed. An elderly woman volunteers to wash the wux herself. An old man with curly hair and a disheveled beard only needs a word to go fetch water. He brings it in unbelievably large quantities. He makes sure we have all we need, and with an apologetic smile he stops to warm his chilled hands, brushing large icicles off his beard into the stove. Pardon me, sir, I am old. He smiles sadly. They shovel snow, chop wood, peel potatoes, stick branches on either side of the paths. Everything goes smoothly and by itself. We have a few prisoners on the battery who look after the horses and help at the field kitchen. They wear white armbands and have identification cards. It doesn't seem to occur to them that it could be any other way. The old man sits behind me in the corner and smokes a self-twist of newspaper and tobacco from our butts with a sense of gratitude. They sit behind us and eat their soup with spoons, which we, in their terms, neglect and they see nothing wrong with it. No sullen looks, not the slightest antagonism. Thank you, sir. They say it for any little thing done for them. Happy eyes of children and a low bow for the smallest gift. A German soldier is good. We burn their houses, we take their last cow from the barn, and take the last potatoes from their cellars. We strip them of their felt boots. They are often yelled at and treated roughly. However, they always collect their bundles and leave with us, from Kalinin and from all the villages along the road. We allocate a special team to take them to the rear. 
anything to get them to the other side. What a schism, what a contrast, what these people must have gone through. What a mission it must be to restore order and peace to them, to provide them with work and bread. Quickly, the days flew by without much tension. But much is going on within us, and I only wish I had time to write about it all. I am, however, in good health. My health is the best it has ever been. Our vegetable garden is excellent. The lettuce is still a little bluish because the nights are cold. But everything is growing up, except somewhat slowly, and in the meantime we have a lovely kind of spinach from the nettles. I should be writing a dissertation on vegetable gardening. But there is so much waiting to be written about, and time is divided into a huge number of little segments. Evening. Another day of small joys and worries is over. If you count as a small joy the feeling of putting your whole self into leading people. It is a task that requires constant readiness, kindness, a strong grip, and an intuitive sense of what is most important. What a mixture of wisdom and firmness is needed to command in the third year of war. But also what a profession. It fills me with happiness at the feeling that I can give so much to the good that people come to me with confidence. Their faces light up when they see me, and they are revitalized and feel more confident when I pass by with words of greeting. I need to find the right word in the moment. How right you are, Mom. As I write all this down, I remember that this is exactly what you yourself were talking about. Sunday. For the last three days I've been temporarily in command of the battery headquarters. Early in the morning I rode on horseback along the telephone communication line to the 12th to take a bath. I had quite time to do this at the trench where Wren stood up on his hind legs three times before skipping across, shivering and breathing hard. For the first time we fought each other for a quarter of an hour before he gave up. Both of us were soaking wet afterward. We had scarcely had time to leave the artillery position when it was subjected to an intense bombardment by the enemy's heavy guns. Pieces and lumps of earth were falling into the water to the right and left of the ford where we had taken shelter. When I released the reins during a break in the shelling, the horse went up the slope and swum across the trench without hesitation. Later I walked through the dugouts and met non-commissioned officer Carl who had returned to the unit two days ago from a mission that had required his absence for nearly a year. Carl is a tall blonde guy who exemplifies a good comrade and a good soldier. So is it good to be back in the old company? I asked him. Sir, he said, searching for the right words. When I came back, I noticed it at once, and the boys say as much. It's quite a different atmosphere here now. Isn't it worth leading a life like this? My days are so full that they seem to be looming on top of each other. My vacation is long behind me, and although sometimes homesickness gnaws at me, I'll soon get over it. Each day we feel anew that this summer is a gift to us. We live for today. I was lying on the slope by the dugout. It was the middle of the day. The blanket beneath me was hot. There was no breeze. Insects, glistening with ketan, scurried through the air. They made gentle buzzing sounds, like an organ. My thoughts drifted away in waves of light purple, and dreams raised their red sails. I don't know how long I lay there when the telephone receiver slipped off the receiver and hit me on the shoulder. I jumped up, staggering half awake. What was that? Was it Pan's black and white goat face looming over me with a vicious grin? He was immovable, staring at me with his yellow eyes and smiling mockingly surrounded by swaying grass, while the wind fluttered his sparse beard. God Goat Pan, are you putting this far east on the line? But then the phone came up, and I realized it was just our little goat. He jumped up and galloped away after his foster father, until his thin bleeding was silent in the midday heat. I followed him with a glance, smiling, and picked up the phone. Hello Whistle. Is this loot? Prepare for battle and the goat god's whistle was drowned out by the singing of our big guns. I waded through the heat to our vegetable garden. It is spread out among the wild meadows like an island in the palm of the Lord God's hand. I could feel the touch of the earth with my bare feet. It's strange that one can have vegetable gardens here on the front lines, and we are grateful for it.
People's faces are relaxed and peaceful as they lean over the plants. We have always lacked lettuce and vegetables in our diet, and it was a matter of cold calculation to plant oats and potatoes on 120 acres of land near the Ashland deployment. But the joy of the work was evident, and many of us had extra seeds sent from home. In the evenings, the occupants of our dugout stood around their little flower bed and, with a crude irony, opened the secret doors of their hearts to each other. What else were they sowing flowers for? It's fascinating to watch them watch the sunflowers, Rosita, nasturtiums, asters, and humble marigolds grow. I know it has been said before, but the serenity of plants matters more than ever to man at a time like this, when the sacred order of things is disturbed. In normal times, I would come with a bouquet of fresh flowers. I wish I could do that. Nor can I roam these fields putting together the most magnificent bouquet, but I can bring my own hand-grown flowers, delicate poppies that open their petals in the morning red, yellow, and purple. If only I could bring them to you. You know how at home I used to pick them growing in abundance and give them to all who shared the joy with me. In the evenings, when the plants need water, we go to the little stream with jugs and buckets and water them through tins with pierced bottoms. The lowland fills with the laughter of men pouring water over each other's heads. In the still air, mosquitoes in the bushes perform their dance behind a thin haze. But they don't bother us too much because there is a constant breeze blowing, and not a single false note disturbs this great symphony of water and sunshine. The scent of grasses and warm nights, and this peace that reigns over our sector like the dome of a bell. I was camped out in the woods when I received my mail and had no time to read it. When at last it was possible to do so, we had had time to travel a long way, and Ren and I were hurrying toward home. The reins rested on his neck. Now, and then I swatted away the mosquitoes. The road formed a black streak through the wet grass that stretched across the ground on the right and left sides green, yellow, and purple colors with light flecks of bells and buttercups. But when I put aside the sheet of paper, only red brooms and sorrel were already visible in the light of the setting sun, like countless little hearts. I spurred Ren on. Of late the enemy's front line had remained practically unchanged. The same could be said for his artillery positions, which were about equal to ours. Tanks have rarely appeared. This is the quietest sector we have ever had. But still the enemy's reconnaissance detachments are active. During June we drove back 36 of them, and on June 24 repulsed an attack by force by a battalion south of Pishinka, when it lost 240 of its 360 men. On July 1 an enemy sentry of 30 to 40 men infiltrated through the infantry positions at the advanced outpost of the 12th Battery. The attack was unexpected and followed a very short artillery preparation by mortars and light guns. This was at 4.30. The infantry made a temporary withdrawal from the point of penetration. The forward observation line was broken, and the observer had to run to company headquarters to call fire on the infantry position. An enemy lookout confused the signalmen in the dugout where they were trying to establish communications. The telephone was shot to pieces and the enemy took it with them. The radio operator managed to hide but the scouts captured the radio and the artillery observer's map. They also dragged away with them the body of one of our dead infantrymen. They left one of their own dead behind. We expended 87 shells repelling the attack. In the trench and in front of the barrier wire this evening we counted 28 killed on the enemy side. Perhaps it would have been wishful thinking if we had imagined that we would be left alone this summer. Of course, we were wrong. Once again, we are heading for things to undergo a fundamental change, not that we are avoiding it. We still have hidden forces that accelerate our movement and give firmness to our voices when we sense danger. We have a summer and a third winter ahead of us. They do not want to reconcile themselves to the thought of having to continue to serve without leave. I myself stand back with a slight smile and watch the events unfold. Everything is going according to plan a plan woven by fate. We are but cogs. The century is going through its illness. We'll see if it has the strength to overcome the chaos. I remain calm, 
a calm that does not try to fight the course of events, but passes through them as if transformed, as a result of which nothing changes in our character, except that we understand ourselves more deeply. Not tired. Some think it is exhausted, but the soldiers are driven only by hope, hope and the dream of home. They will be disappointed. The division is no more exhausted than any other. We won't get any reinforcements, I'm sure of it. But the summer will be lighter. And once more, it will be flowers and grasses instead of heat and dust. As Yo said very aptly, some see frost, a pale moon, and maybe a cat sneaking around in the dark. Others see only frost in the bushes. There's no special merit to it. It's a way of life. We've just been made that way. That gives a lot of strength. I'm glad of that. Yo. The Germans launched an offensive against the southern sector on July 5 with 17 armored divisions, all they could muster. The Russians, however, waited behind extensive minefields, and their main forces were pulled behind the front line. For seven days the Germans prepared a withdrawal. Almost immediately, the Russians launched a counteroffensive, and by the end of the month it had spread to the central sector. Consequently, Pab's division, which apparently had been in reserve in the Smolensk area, was hastily redesignated the Southeast Division and thrown in to help hold off the Russian onslaught, which cut the Germans' communications beyond Orel. This venture had some success, but Orel had to be abandoned on August 5. The ensuing withdrawal was initially unhurried, but became disorderly when the Germans began to be harassed by air attacks, partisans, and infantry groups breaking through. These events drove Pabst back through Bryansk, across the Desna River northwest to the Moscow-Minsk Highway. There, in a battle that remained a mystery and not described by him, he met his death, which so often occupied his mind. At 7.30 we left Gradino and moved towards the highway. The sky was in a solid cloud cover, visibility was poor, and we were being quietly pelted with rain. We took one last look at our vegetable gardens and friendly hills before our vehicles changed course. The horses invariably walked ahead. Their flanks were rounded, and they were glossy after a long rest. We were moving fast. At 1 p.m. we reached Yartsev and stopped among the ruins of large buildings. We stood at the edge of the grass border by a miserable road facing the preserved base of a gypsum monument, a relic of proletarian culture. There was steam over the field kitchen. At 3 p.m., we began boarding the train. The inclined platform was wide enough to accommodate all the vehicles of the combat echelon. Everything went by quickly. Soon, all the vehicles were secured with wooden fasteners and bolted down with wire. The horses were on their platforms, knee-deep in hay. Bivouacs were erected between the vehicles because there was not enough room in the hay near the horses for everyone. Severinov, a Russian mercenary, came to say goodbye. The shifting fortunes of the vicissitudes of war had made him homeless. He had served in a unit for a few weeks, and now he wanted to stay with his family, who had found work in Yartsevo. He came to us with a heavy heart, silent and withdrawn and it occurred to me that he must be carrying a heavy burden of sad memories. He had found some support in us. Now, as he stood before me, his long, bony hand shook mine once more. In that shake was everything he wanted to put into words. And yet he had to say something, even at the risk of being only half understood by me. He made a sort of little speech, with his hand trembling slightly, unwilling to let go of mine, and all the while he looked me straight in the eye. His caddy was rising and falling in his skinny throat, and though I could hardly understand a word, I took in the meaning, and it was a good thing it was like that. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. At nine o'clock p.m., we started moving. Half an hour later, I drifted off to sleep and awoke for the first time, just before midnight. When we stopped in R, I had a good night's sleep from four o'clock to six o'clock, I washed my face under a stream of water from a fire hydrant. There were girls walking along the iron bridge that crossed the road with flowers in their hands. Further along the line of defense were guard posts behind thick red Indian-style fencing. The woodland on either side of the road had been cut down to provide a field of vision. 
the charred rusty remains of good wagons derailed. Under the cover of anti-aircraft guns, numerous freight trains carrying ammunition and food rolled to the front. Empty trains were moving back. Somewhere five threshing machines stood as if forgotten on the spare track. At eight o'clock I saw the first sunflowers in D. They were growing in the vegetable garden. The landscape opened up in a wide panorama. We were on the way to B. For a long time the terrain here was devoid of forests or other landmarks. The step went into infinity. The hills gently smoothed out like waves on the surface of the sea in the doldrums. From time to time, there were groups of birch trees with sadly hanging branches, like a thin shawl on the shoulders of an old woman, and in the villages the trees stood in small clusters. The villages were scattered around as randomly as if their builders hadn't quite realized where the end of this endless country was. The neighborhood was divided into green and yellow strips, and the houses seemed even lower among the potato beds and swaying ears. Wind-blown, weather-beaten, with sagging thatched roofs, they presented a pathetic and pitiful sight in the dreary light of day. The larger villages, with a few factory buildings each, looked even more hopeless. But there were isolated places where streams of water cut through the earth bed and a plain was formed, and even very small streams cut strikingly wide strata. Here one might suddenly come out on a steep slope with villages and clumps of trees, and this gave the landscape a more cheerful appearance. We walked through this country for a long time, and the Pasha's faces stretched out. The scarcity of firewood made warfare difficult, but by the end of the day we were cheerful again. There were forests, even if they were forests in a swamp. We chattered our feet contentedly in the open doors of the freight cars. After all, we would have no shortage of timber for building dugouts and for setting up artillery positions. Russia was again in good order. At the stations, as always, ragged, barefooted children were begging, Pan, give me bread. In a strange contrast, the latest model military vehicles rolled along the road behind them. Huge industrial plants grew suddenly among the forests, and even if only tall chimneys stood among burnt-out barns and piles of stones, the tension between the two worlds was all too obvious. The unnoticed difference between towers with balconies like swallows' nests and the poor thatched shacks of peasants. But what did we care? We were at war. We wouldn't have time in the coming weeks to fill our heads with such thoughts. The bottle went round and round. N. leaned out of the window, his profile standing out against the evening sky. Weathered skin clung tightly to his perfectly sculpted skull. It made him look like a skeleton, a mask with an expression of intense determination. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. We spent nearly the whole day waiting outside B, whose tall buildings towered over the river banks. Before dark, we mused on violin, clarinet, accordion, and my guitar. Then we lay in the straw, only waking up and falling asleep again with the movement of the train. At four o'clock, we reached our destination. It was July 31st. We looked at the neglected station, whose only distinguishing feature was a sloping platform for loading military equipment. A column of wagons emerged from the woods, one vehicle after another, the horses walking at a fast trot, and all the time at the same distance from each other. They disappeared around the next corner like ghosts from another world. We unloaded the wagons and proceeded to the village, where we rested until 7.30. Then we made a long march. A richer and more extensive landscape came into view than at first appeared. Vet galloped beside me and said it reminded him of Ukraine. Far ahead we could hear the deafening rumble of the front, powerful and menacing as in better times. We moved with long gaps between vehicles through the heat of the close day. Everything seemed so familiar. The sweat and sand, the short breaks and concern for the horses, the thirst, and the stops for food on the side of the road. Squadrons of fighter planes roared past in the blue sky toward the enemy, and dark puffs of smoke from bursts could be seen ahead in the woods. The thunderstorm broke with a rumble, but the atmosphere remained oppressive. Heat hung over the ripening fields in the vast fertile countryside. The horses pulling the wagons were breathing heavily, their chests foaming with exertion. I rode ahead most of the time, 
following the signs that marked our path. They led us along the highway and on through dirt roads until, late in the afternoon, we reached an abandoned village. It lay at the edge of the marshy woods. There were no more signs, and we stopped, not knowing how long we should stay here. We looked doubtfully at the sky, spread out, and camouflaged the vehicles, and were leading the horses away when the Rede appeared. They came out from the direction of the sun and made themselves known. Our machine guns responded. Then they moved away. No harm was done to us. But behind us, to the west, there was smoke and fire, and a kilometer ahead our battery commander was stuck with his vehicle in a swamp. They blew the battery to pieces. We spent the night there, but the night was short. At 2.30 we were on the march again, moving back along the same road we came in on because there was no passage immediately ahead. It took us a full day's march to reach the place, which was seven kilometers away if you fly like crows in a straight line, and ended at a bridgehead, which our troops had recaptured the day before. The situation was in many ways unclear. I had already noticed on the way that there were not many of the supply detachments that one usually finds behind the main front. Beyond the swampy forests along which we were moving, there was only a fluid line of defense consisting mostly of strongholds for which both sides fought with mixed success. There were gaps of several kilometers between them. Our troops were just still approaching. The enemy had cut the line of communication with a vital highway, but our counterattack was on its way. We had to close the gap. We got into position quickly without spending much time in preparation. Just posted sentries and kept our eyes open. In the evening I came out of the woods along a narrow path to look at a small village immediately next door to us. It had only civilians in it. It was reported to me that there were still many young men in it, which seemed rather suspicious because of the great danger the guerrillas posed. It was perfect terrain for them. The trail led through some patches of swampy ground. One had to quickly jump over the trunks of fallen trees. Suddenly you emerge from the thicket and find yourself in front of a village. It is surrounded by yellow wheat crops, shiny barley, and dark green potato fields, just like an island among the forests. To the southeast, the terrain dropped steeply to a marshy lowland with stunted shrubs that stretched down to the river along which the front line ran. No one was visible here. Beyond the river began the forest, which gave us so much trouble because of its great length and dense undergrowth. When you look at the map, all you see are small, widely scattered villages concentrated on the backside of the elongated gentle hills. We took a long look at the terrain and agreed that it would be difficult for the enemy to break through here. As we turned toward the village with its inhabitants, most of whom lived in dugouts, we saw the usual expanse of trampled earth in front of each house. It was cleanly swept, and sheaves stood in a semicircle around it. In the center of one such space an old man was sowing wheat. He tossed the grain with a broad shovel, the wind blew the chaff out, and the golden grains fell to the ground. Much, much bread, he said. One could sense that the bounty of the land was reflected in his words and in the gestures of him and those around him. On a step of the stairs sat a young girl and looked at me. She wore a light-colored dress, her eyes were clear and intelligent, and she seemed to me more attractive than any other girl I had seen for a long time. But I dismissed the thought the moment it occurred to me, for I could not afford to think about it. The young men who had been the object of my visit came toward me with an easy gait. They squinted at me. But upon closer inspection, I saw that they just looked more sinister than they really were, and confidence grew with the first cigarette. I wondered whether it was necessary to lock them up for the night. It was no good if they went over to the enemy. But that was too troublesome. I couldn't keep half of Russia under surveillance. In the end I decided to send my assistants as propagandists. The presence of the girls had already made them restless. The people here are of a livelier character than those in the Smolensk area. They are more cheerful and open-minded. The influence of the South is already felt. Some of the women of more respectable age still wore a sort of national costume. They wore white headscarves, tied as on nuns, with a colored ribbon around the forehead. On the coifs, at the neckline, is a narrow embroidered border, 
and the sleeves are fastened to the shoulders with colored ribbon three inches wide. They wear a white cloth tied around the calves crosswise by means of black ribbons. Their bare feet are visible underneath. Almost all the men wear beards. Their heads are covered with unkept hair, often whitened as well. Hunched over their wagons with stunted horses, ragged and barefoot, sitting so low that their feet almost touch the ground, they look like dwarves. With grunts and the snap of whips they chase their sturdy horses, these haggard creatures that they control with a rope tied around their muzzles. Even the children treat them as if trotting were their normal condition. I saw an old man who ruled his horse while lying on his stomach on a rye cart loaded on a cart, his eyes gleaming mischievously in his wild bearded face. I saw another who wore a field felon's mustache, the tips of which were always tucked upward. He told me he had been a prisoner of war in Mainz during the Great War. I stood in the middle of the village handing out candy to the children. I was about to give another boy another one, but he refused, saying he already had one, and stepped back, smiling. Two candies, come to think of it. That's too much. It would be a great impudence and dishonorable to a friendly foreigner. It's true. At five o'clock the attack on the road leading to K was to begin. There was no rest until then. The telephone was not silent all the time. The guys laid many kilometers of wire, but they were on their feet all night because of the constant breaking of communication lines. Line passing in the woods was a certain difficulty, getting within range of a too meticulous sentry in a state of heightened vigilance was a considerable danger. Communications over vast distances in the sector left much to be desired. Half the conversation, as always, was redundant. Lieutenant Von Ruhl shouted and lost his temper and several times was on the verge of smashing the telephone. Every now and then the battery commander would growl like a bear that had hurt its paw. We were very tired after the march and the business of the day, but try as we might, we could not sleep. As soon as it began to get light, the tent canopy was thrown back and the cold morning air rushed in. This time I stood in the back with the doctor while the others went to artillery positions. The attack began simultaneously from the north and south. Its purpose was to close a gap of nearly two kilometers, including the bridge, then push the front as far east as possible to secure a line of communication along the road. On our side, while advancing from the north, a slow offensive was underway against the resisting enemy on the right flank. Our losses were heavy. Enemy snipers, some with machine guns, huddled in trees waiting for our infantry to pass, and then opened fire from the rear. The enemy's tactics proved to be vigorous and flexible. It was impossible to deploy artillery in the swampy forests, but he made up for this deficiency by making extensive use of mortars. At the bridge he entrenched, competently positioned, and well-camouflaged defensive positions, on which, among other things, were installed sixteen flamethrowers. Here we lost our battery commander. His place was taken by the light battery commander. After an artillery preparation from his guns, he collected the infantry. At the same time, another battalion commander organized other units, which were scattered by heavy losses and the death of their officers. So the attack was renewed. On his own initiative, the commander of another light battery broke through from the south with his liaison officers and a few infantrymen. He crossed the bridge and captured the enemy positions northeast of it in hand-to-hand -hand combat. At the same time, the Pashi left wing broke through the swampy forest from the north and broke through to the enemy positions quite unexpectedly. In this way, a connection took place. In the course of the Operation T, on the east side of the road, was taken. The unit lost two officers and three soldiers. Those of the wounded who could walk remained with us. Our losses and those of the infantry, especially among the old and experienced soldiers, indicated the difficulty and peculiarity of the operation. About noon I was called to the operation's headquarters. We moved it to another location, R, which was still under incessant shelling, including occasional artillery fire. We buried our tents, and the entire echelon involved in the battle moved forward. By evening it became quiet. The surgeon treasurer appeared and took away the first mail. We sat down outside the tent 
and drank a bottle of wine. It was a natural rhyme Mosulwain, and in the silence of twilight all was enveloped in an atmosphere of peace. After the gap had been closed and the danger of a breakthrough to Birar removed, communications were gradually restored to the regiment. News came from Battery No. 12, 10 kilometers to the south. Meissner, one of our oldest comrades, had also been hit. Franz and I said with a chuckle that the two of us were long overdue, and as it was Franz's birthday, two days ago, I pulled out the bottle I had saved for the occasion. Shortly after noon we received a report advising us not to continue the entrenchment. The division is moving further south on the highway. We have no regrets. We are anxious to change this place of stay, which is rather unfriendly for a better one. There is unusual activity in the air on both sides. During the night the enemy made a massive air raid on Bear, or O. Oh, there was a great rumble, and the air above us was filled with the rattling of slow, heavy-fueled airplanes, which the infantry call coffee grinders or sewing machines. The telephonists left at 3 o'clock. At 5 o'clock, the artillery echelon and horses arrived. Hardly had we just entered the road as the first attack of the fighters followed. It was no nonsense, and such raids continued all day. The fighters were flying freely back and forth over the road in squadrons, and even in larger numbers. There was a terrible rumble on each side, and our fighters contributed to it. But for the men on the road there was little consolation in this. Needless to say, we camouflaged the wagons, and even the horses. They looked like leaf huts in motion. We made it to the end without loss, but the second lost two horses and four men wounded. The new position was a miserable patch of woods. We had just furnished new positions, a considerable number of them, and one detachment had spent two hours setting up one kilometer in length across the swamp when new orders arrived. We are now stationed in the immediate vicinity of the regiment, close to the road. The dust raised from the traffic on the road is coming at us in thick puffs. The telephonists sit with their tongues out. They look at me from under heavy, like Danish dogs, eyelids. This scorching heat will wear anyone out. The situation in the air has not improved. Main front line, there's no escaping that fact. And here we're not even in one of the most critical areas, to the east of us, where the front makes an arc to O. It's already more serious rumbling can be heard. The less said about the southern part of the city, the better. The front is shifting. Even our own position is fickle. Fate will decide who will be buried in this conflict. Overnight the division occupied another regimental sector farther to the right. The enemy retreated in some places. My reconnaissance squad climbed a tall spruce tree to help provide a temporary light system to mark targets. It was reported that two enemy units, each numbering 150 men, had broken through on the right flank. Some of them were destroyed, but the greater part went into the woods to reinforce the guerrillas. Two cavalry squadrons have appeared in our rear and are trying to make contact with the enemy across our front line. Normally the partisans do not attack combat units, but we have to take precautions. Of course, we raid the guerrillas and patrols are regularly posted in the rear of our combat echelons, but what good is that? Drenched in sweat and harassed by mosquitoes, ours fight their way through the dense undergrowth. They squelch through swamps and stretch along trails in the green twilight of the forests. They look exotic with machine guns on their shoulder and machine gun belts around their necks, but they haven't accomplished much. They don't even compare to the Russians in the forests. Last night two types of their cavalry squadron raced down the highway past the 11th Battery's ammunition wagon. Before our boys woke up and realized what was happening, they were gone. In the early hours of that morning and until the middle of the day a great noise of battle was heard to the southeast, where the front was retreating. It has become quieter. Preparations are underway for a change of position. Day by day the blue sky is filled with fighter planes. Stormtroopers with shining red stars roar over the treetops as if they want to trim them with their blue fuselages. We fire as fast as we can, but the rascals are well armed and protected. This evening the heavy fuel planes made regular flights hour after hour to the rear area. It looked as if they had opened an official air corridor. Since they were not dropping many bombs, 
they were probably making large-scale transportation flights. August 10, 1943. During the few pauses I have appeared, I am trying to organize these pages I have written from mid-July to the present. Occasionally I get up and stroll over to Wren, who remains farther back in the woods, or rather in the undergrowth. He turns his handsome head, looks in my pocket, and pokes me judgmentally with his muzzle if he doesn't find anything there. There was unusual activity in the air again last night. Hour after hour passed, but with the difference that this time Ivan was throwing bombs around. We couldn't even light a cigarette. Most of the bombs spat into the swamp, but it looked as if the tension following the howling in the air did not subside. Last night there was a hit on the front of the 11th battery. They had one man badly wounded. At 19.30, they moved to a better position. At 10 p.m., we received orders to change position in the morning. We have been following the road since 6.00. We roll without respite along the big highway toward K. The wagons follow at intervals of a hundred yards. Branches stick out of them. And even the horses' heads are decorated with greenery that sways in time with their steps. Airplanes are above us all the time both ours and the enemy's. The noise of their machines rises and subsides, changing from a high pitch to a low tone as they circle one another or try to dodge anti-aircraft artillery shots. The sound rises to a high menacing screech as they dive onto the road. The smoke from the bombs mixes with the mushroom-shaped puffs of smoke from our shells that fly over the backside of the forest and over the city blocks. Silent dark tongues of flame rise across the horizon. Before us is a picture of scorched earth. At 2.30 p.m., we made our first rest stop. It was west of K, in a small wooded area. Strips of shelters on each side of the road formed one large temporary military camp. Horses with bloated bellies lay curled up by the side of the road. Those that were still alive fumbled in terror. On difficult stretches of road, the usual congestion occurred. Horses were exhausted as they pulled overloaded wagons across the murderous sands, through deep gaps in the mire mire, and over broken log roads. Once the long column stood up. When I finally made my way to the head of the column, I saw there an unfortunate peasant's wagon stuck in the mud. It was, of course, overloaded. The poor horse stood breathing heavily with its flanks bulging, sweat rolling down its belly. The horse is caput, the woman wailed, holding a bundle of grass in front of his nose. Then even I came to my senses. As our own charioteers approached the difficult section, they'd mounted the horse without a saddle. A blow with a whip on the back of the harnessed horses, a few encouraging words, and the horses pulled out. This is all done quietly, unlike the noise and shouting in marching columns with horses. The Russians beat their horses to get them up and they have absolutely no idea how to handle our taller horses. At 7.30 p.m., we turned into a wooded area for a night's rest. It opened out before us after a few hundred yards, and we found ourselves on the edge of a deciduous forest, like a woodland park whose ancient trees shaded an overgrown meadow. A slight steep slope led down to a clear stream. Dusk descended softly and slowly, and on the horizon blue mingled with red fire. We threw off our clothes and plunged into the warm water while the first stars rose above us. After all the noise, dust, and heat, the hour was singularly marvelous. At five o'clock we set out again. It was a bad road. The sand was so shaky in places that we had to make log decks. We passed between spruce trees near the railroad leading to B. There were two open valleys on the way over which we had to pass on some portions of the march. Here the road, which in other places was wide, narrowed to the size of a country road. The wagons rushed down the slope and piled up in front of the narrows. They stood so that their wheels formed an angle with the surface of the log road, which threatened to fall under the weight of the load. With wild shouts from the charioteers, the heavily laden wagons clattered and slid over potholes and fascines laid in the most dangerous places. Mud splashed upward, and the horses breathed heavily. After looking for some time at all that was going on, we began to act. On the nearest hill were the ruins of a village. 
It took only 15 minutes to go there and fetch the first load of logs. Log after log. Pretty soon we had a solid surface, hooked up the hubs, gave it a good push, and the first wagon was on its way again. Gradually the congestion cleared and the wagons came into motion. We crossed the bridge, which was already hanging, wobbling on its abutments. Then we found ourselves on a new line of defense. It was on the west side of the river valley, a bastion of logs and earth much higher than human height. In front of it teams were already at work setting up wire fences, and everything in the foreground that the enemy could use as cover had been destroyed. At B, we turned to the northwest. We passed through the gates of a ruined power station, which had once been connected with a large industrial establishment. Then we passed over a lock bridge with a large reservoir and disappeared into the woods again. A high-voltage cable stretched on poles through a clearing to some other plants hiding far away in the deserted area. Again we fought another war with another swamp and sands. The log road stretched through green puddles of standing water, where corky trees rose like abundantly grown bridges and islands. Sometimes the treacherous swamp was hidden beneath a treacherous carpet of beautiful green moss, no one but a fugitive or an outlaw would have passed here. Trees lay where they had been broken by storm or old age. Under the roof of thick foliage there was absolute silence. The stench hung lazily in the still air, in which only the buzzing of mosquitoes could be heard the open space appeared. The village came into view. The sentries of the advance guard appeared. In the old forest, in which we were permanently camped, we could not be seen at all. With its firs and spruces, birches and beeches, the forest stretched across dunes and misty lowlands. Far below stood the young trees, bursting into light from behind the trunks of centuries-old trees. There is a green twilight, a golden emerald light playing over the ferns, over the moss and grass. Sometimes it looks like moving under glass or the depths of a sunlit body of water. Our heavy boots fall silently into the soft soil. Among the moss, the leaves of blueberry bushes and smooth red cranberries glisten as if smoothly polished. It's a real mushroom paradise here. I do not know all their names and species, but I found yellow balls with ink-colored dots, which are always hidden under the cover of moss. There is a connoisseur among us who insists they are truffles. We ate truffles in the south of France where the sun heated the steps of the house and our rooms had red tile floors. Our product squad made a second visit to a neighborhood that had survived the present battle. The war had passed through it several times, and it had not been spared both the battles involving regular troops and bandit raids. Few wooden houses have survived. Now smoke wafts from the last ruins. There, during one summer, the ground had become overgrown with grass. After two summers you can hardly find a path, except that here and there a dilapidated, weather-beaten fence with silver-white posts separating the vegetable garden looks different. The bridges are rotting fast. The paths are overgrown. Wild carrots and lupines, marmalade and wormwood have taken over everything. Soon only lumberjack trails in the forest wilderness will be left there. The detachment returned with three heavily laden wagons. They brought large dry potatoes with grains of sand on their thin peels, cabbage, beets, carrots, pumpkins, and onions. A solid ham of horse meat hangs in the field kitchen. Three cows stroll between the trees, and milk for Sunday pudding splashes in buckets. They said there was an abandoned forester's house. We rode on narrow sandy trails through glistening marsh, through sun-drowned glades. Above us, the wind blew through the treetops but there was only the creak of leather, the breathing of horses, and the clatter of their hooves on the soft earth below. When we dismounted and tied them up, the silence was complete. Yellow chanterelles were abundant in the moss. They grew under the young spruce and in the holes left by the uprooted trees. The bag on my saddle quickly became full. We rode through wild undergrowth where it was almost dark. Thick seaweed protruded from puddles, Branches whipped in our faces, and trees overhung the trail. Sometimes we had to cling to the horse's withers. Once we met a lone horse messenger, but we met no one else for four hours. The forester's house stood in a small clearing. 
The wind blew through open doors and broken windows. A sprout nodded from behind the fence, the last echo of habitation. Some fields had once cut into the surrounding woods, but they had long since become overgrown with grass. The fences had fallen down. The bedbugs in the great room had long since starved to death and dried up in the crevices of the brown roof. My foot fell through the rotted, moss-covered floor of the threshold. There was something to be taken there, though sturdy barn floorboards, attic front boards, doors, and benches. It was worth sending a wagon for that. The airplanes were over us again all night. They bombed B. By morning, it was raining. With it came a cold, inclement day. Rain is not a gift if you are standing in a camp. We dragged a roof from the village and fixed it between the trees. Even a pair of nesting waders did not flutter from tree to tree so animatedly, and their whistling sounded faintly through the rain. Only once did the sun reflected on the raindrops hanging on the branches, and then the smoke of the campfires was blue and clear. We were cold. In the evening, the airplane dropped out of the sky, in a steep curve, faster and faster with terrible flames and the terrible roar of the engines. The performance came to a sudden halt. The noise cut off abruptly, and there was a red glow. The night fighter was singing its silver song over the dark forest. But at the same time they appeared over us again later, and the ground shook hour after hour. August 22, 1943 Last night, when the wet roof of the tent glistened in the milky light, when in the darkness after the rain one could hardly distinguish the man opposite, and could hear nothing but the voice from the loudspeaker rattling over my ear, I felt for a while as if I had gone out of myself and was quite alone. In my weariness, I felt that I had been seized by the melancholy that seizes us when we see the inevitable approaching. Having lost all hope, I felt that there remained in me that last hardness, like a steel rod of energy, which I consider one of the greatest gifts of man. Later the airplane made a circle over our heads, bringing with it something new in the field of propaganda. To our great amazement, it indulged us with music and speech. The music was unbearable, the words inaudible, but the alien intonation and unrestrained hatred in the words were obvious. It even seemed natural that the airplane would open machine gun fire in the final. It put the situation back on the foundation of clear and honest relations. At 7 o'clock 80 enemy bombers were flying over us in the B direction. They appeared against the morning sky, squadron by squadron, in a clear formation. It was an impressive sight, and we froze in anticipation. We were not disappointed. At 7.15 we received word from the observation post that six of them had been firing for 90 seconds. The roar of the engines and the crackle of the machine guns continued for nearly an hour. We had no more time to listen to them, but subsequently 45 enemy machines were on the ground. At 8 o'clock the observers of the 11th battery came under heavy fire from heavy artillery, which fired 20 shells that struck the blockhouse by the railroad. Two of them hit the observation tower. The effect was almost nil. The observation continued. In the afternoon at the 10th battery one man was killed by a stray shell. The noise of the battle was especially loud on our left flank. The light battery has been withdrawn from that line and sent to the right because we expect a strong attack to the south follow the reports of the adjusters like a temperature chart. In the evening we moved into a new dugout and for the first time in weeks could take off our clothes. When our horses returned last night from pasture, a black cow came with them. She was trusty and affectionate, and we petted her very much. When I went to the stable at dusk, our charioteers were in ambush. I stood leaning against a tree for a while, my gaze wandering over their faces. They all turned in my direction, and a devilish temptation hung over us. I gave them free rein, and they immediately set to work. Soon the cow was hanging from crossed logs far out in the undergrowth. We did not know then that it belonged to the third battery. But we found out that night because teams of searchers showed up. They calmed our camp up and down, and today they came armed on horses and with dogs. They stood at the field kitchen, wary and suspicious. They sat there until evening with tired eyes and haggard faces, 
but by that time they were already convinced of our honesty, even though Lieutenant Ari told them, Take a good look around the old headquarters of my battery. They are masters at it. But they could not match us. When a field officer arrived with suspicions, I lined up the charioteers and told them that anyone who saw a cow belonging to the third battery must catch it and notify its personnel, as friends are supposed to do. This was the last straw, and the charioteers thought they would have a stroke. It was a picturesque scene. When I gave the command to disperse, they rushed away, looking for a hiding place to spew their restrained laughter. We were lousy. But we had vermicelli soup with a wonderful yellow fat floating on the surface. Yesterday a messenger arrived from Lieutenant R., who asked us for a couple of cups of milk. We were glad to share with him in the name of old friendship. This morning he arrived, and we invited him to lunch. We had just had some very good goulash, and in large quantities. Toward evening we had coffee with him. He was charming and we concluded that we were low, black souls whose meanness was boundless. We promised to treat him to milk whenever he wished, but we could not open ourselves to our crime. We rode again to the forester's house. My strong horse rode like the devil. The branches that grazed our faces were weighed down by the glistening drops of rain. Beneath the yogas lay the first red leaves. The grass was yellow, and the fields took on a gray hue. Here we are and this summer is nearing its end. A week ago, we started building a defensive artillery position, set up as a second reserve position. In the meantime, we had a visit from someone in charge. The supply officer painted a very bleak picture of the supply situation for the coming winter, but it had been so for so many years that it could not upset us anymore. He concluded by saying that it was intended to send another team to the rear for hay so that we might at least be able to save some raw forage. This we vowed to do. At the previous position we had gathered mountains of raw forage. Week after week, tired teams gathered hay into stacks in the Dnieper meadows. This work distracts not only supply teams, but also able-bodied soldiers from active units. But there is nothing we can do about it. The additional needs of the unit and the supply difficulties are too great. We are obliged to live off the land. Yesterday morning the regiment sent a team to the rear to collect horses. Our battery allotted a sergeant and five other men on a truck. Each was given ninety live cartridges and instructed to take away the partisans' horses. Pretty good business, isn't it? Here we are on part of the Eastern Front, which used to be partisan territory itself, except for the swamps at Rokitna and other lovely environs about which I could tell astonishing stories. Guerrilla actions are a prohibited method of warfare. Our fight against them goes beyond any military convention. We have to paint red crosses on our ambulance trains because their presence makes them the object of the most fierce attacks. At 4 p.m. today we stood around the table with sorrowful faces. Then I passed the men who had begun digging our last dugout. They were sitting on the edge of the pit with their chins resting on their hands holding shovels. I made an eloquent gesture in front of them that meant quit working. They stood up, chuckling and shrugging their shoulders. We've been thinking it over so much, they said, but what the hell? And went to their dugouts. Yes, just like that. Be it at least something, but wonderful. If you look on the black side, it's enough to break your heart. If you react in a constructive way, as befits a soldier, it makes you sick. It is a waste of energy and goodwill, a waste of that remarkable, indefatigable spirit of the troops that even now, after four years of war, can still amaze and even awe. It is a waste for which many should be firmly kicked in the ears. Not only have we already completed all of our summer stables, but we have also built underground shelters for sixty-five horses. And what do the people say? They say, and one can judge how much this shows their full confidence, that this is probably done to give us time to go back and build up positions for the winter, that it is really quite a wise move, because this is true, isn't it? There are no Russians around at all. There can't be any. This morning I discovered the first bits of ice in the watering cans. I remember writing this same sentence a year ago. Today I'm repeating it. 
and today that repetition seems daunting. The first signs of impending winter always appear too soon. It only emphasizes the monotony of what is happening, and in that light, all the things whose beauty I was trying to convey pale. Don't the events happening to us in Russia keep coming back to the same act? When I close my eyes, even a change of scenery seems insignificant. The spectacles that made us marvel have seldom been attractive. There is no beauty in this country, nothing to move us or lift our spirits, as there was in other countries whose beauties thrilled us. Despite all the changes, our life here is so monotonous that it is measured out quickly. Perhaps it is for this reason that against this background the human soul appears as something unique. I think about it without bitterness, because it doesn't make you bitter. I am sitting in a soft chair with my legs stretched out. In fact, I'm not sitting, I'm lying in it, just as I used to lie in our big chairs at home. I'm pretty sure that's not how any officer or the most junior of lieutenants do it. Even if the battery commander didn't notice it immediately, he must feel it subconsciously. It only takes a thin layer to penetrate his consciousness. But I'm not going to change my position. It's more important to see the light falling through the amber-colored rum in the bottle, more important to slip out of my form for a moment and no longer feel the boots on my feet. What could be more important? September 9, 1943. I've been sitting over these pages for many days. I have written a great deal, and it gives me food for thought. It is curious that propaganda plays evil jokes on people. It thoroughly entangles the individual. The mind of a nation appears to be like a photographic plate that can be manifested at someone's whim. The delivery of our mail was upset not by the great events of the war, but by their absence. That sounds paradoxical, but it's true. It's because we really shouldn't be here anymore. Actions are practiced to perfection. At the first sign of trouble, the guys at the base signal the usual hasty retreat to a new position. And now there they are, far away from us. Meanwhile, it became clear that there was no hurry and we used the time at our disposal. We dismounted slowly and all the time found work that could be done thoroughly. The squadrons of destruction set to work. For a moment, we were in a state of suspended activity. I, too, sent a large number of wagons to the rear, and with them the main baggage. The course of the epidemic among the horses is unpredictable, and I must not be left without means of transportation. But nothing more is happening. We live on alert and enjoy the peace as long as we can. Day by day, the sun shines more and more faintly through the trees, it no longer provides hardly any heat at all. It is like a copper glow falling on the moss and the young fir trees. The rays of light between the trees no longer blind the eyes. At eight o'clock we brought torches to our dugouts. Flames burst from the doors and window openings, and the smoke hung in a wall among the tall trees. We burned every last board. Then we marched on. At the crossroads at Krochik we paused for lunch. A railroad car was making its last leisurely trip along the rails to the west. Two men sat on it and dropped explosives two charges at a time for a length of fire cord. Two sappers ran behind, setting the explosives under the tracks and inserting the fuses. How the devils they ran, and how spectacularly the thin white jets of flame burst from the ground. Piles of iron whistled all around, and bitter powder smoke floated over our heads. The road behind the railroad was closed for an hour after this. But this was only a part of the destruction wrought, a lockably insignificant part. All the water pipes, all the narrow passages were mined. For hundreds of meters through the forest, red charges were fastened to trees so that they could be thrown across the main road with the least possible time. The villages were set on fire. They burned with incredible vigor. The heat impeded our advance. We galloped through covering our faces from the rain of sparks. The wagons had to go around. Clouds of smoke hit us from the enemy planes, and the noise of explosions around us was like a big battle. On the outskirts of Bryant's, the smoke mixed with the yellow dust of the road, covering us with a double blanket. The sun had turned red long before evening. It hung pale and withered over the destructive action. Over the next march of the stream of men the clouds were illuminated on either side. 
They formed the finest, most magnificent banners I have ever seen, displaying the war in all its awful splendor. We saw houses in all stages of destruction, white as flashes of magnesium, flames shooting out of windows, the first bursts of red flame as it broke through puffs of black smoke, the triumphant dance of the red rooster over the roofs. We rode through the white heat of the dying streets. As the horses and riders ahead of me moved toward the walls of fire, the rifles hanging from their backs looked as toy-like as the peaks of tiny devils on their silhouettes. We saw houses crumble with a rumbling crash. Indescribable was the sight of old birches that, embraced by the heat of the fire, trembled and groaned on the brink of death. Again we rode through a forest of chimneys, rigid and angular, turning under our gaze. Above the black carpet of destructive fire, they had the color of Brussels lace. They towered in the moonlight like the unbending grief-stricken outstretched arms of ghosts, and everywhere around them was a nasty, repulsive, choking cold smoke, a landscape of horror and death. Silent valleys surrounded by blazing torches from afar. The parachute rockets coming down resembled the eyes of cyclopes. The bombs looked like blossoming chrysanthemums with the soft rustle of rolling fire following a sudden burst. By two o'clock in the morning the hoofs of our hurrying horses were already pounding ahead of the battery on the bridge at Ograda. Beyond the vaguely visible river, the horses sprang aside with a snort at the sight of the trenches of the new line of defense. A white mist was rising from the meadows dark under the cover of night. The night sentries were in motion. The men of the advance guard pounced on us with questions about their units. Again we spurred our horses, right and left, right and left. Ankle-deep sand, echoing cobblestones, dark overgrown rivers of silent streets, unfriendly, shabby houses. We drove along part of the new position. A stream of refugees was moving westward along the road. It was replenished by streams from the alleys, directed by a multitude of policemen who were hidden by the dust of thousands of stomping feet. What a dismal spectacle of resettlement. God is merciful. These wretched wagons pulled by cows and little horses. Sometimes people resisted, instinctively, like animals but they are treated roughly. Where are we going? Go to hell. I don't know. Come on, get a move on. And you too, just move west. Hurry up, we don't have time. Where the front puts its paw on, all other life comes to a standstill. It drives a wave that reaches places far away from it. The town below has already changed its appearance. The houses have become the property of those who use them for other purposes, or is it only the Pasha's eyes that see them different? They assess the town opposite the front line of the new frontier and find that it is good. I went into the vegetable gardens nearest the curb, picking tomatoes and flowers there, put a bouquet of velvet brown stars in a cottonwood vase, and set up a table on the porch facing the street. There's a little bench to sit on in the evenings, looking south and west. It is all lit by the sun. The twilight makes the colors darker and brighter as it fights the sunlight. I feel so happy to be alone, the way I know how to do, happy down to my tailbones. Just now at 21.30 we received orders to march at 6 o'clock. Pity this position, this fine line of defense on the western heights, west of the city, with the river as a natural barrier and a battlefield such as we had not had before. I pity Bryansk from whose tall buildings I viewed the burning outskirts. I would have liked to have seen it all that day, too, when we would have been happy to defend it. By four o'clock the night was winding down. It was cold in the dark first hours after midnight. We were still cold when we had already forced the Desna and left the town behind us. Soon I was motoring ahead to scout for resting places, riding in an automobile. I call attention to this because we were moving on a freeway, and I saw no reason to sit back when I could stop, by voting, one of the commander's cars. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Again, I jolted in the car in the evening and found myself in a village spread out on either side of a small valley. This is where we are now. The houses look better on the inside than they do on the outside. Often the house consists of just one tiny room. Typical Russian peasant houses, just one single room with a stove in the middle. 
but they are clean, these rooms, and the people are mobile and open to socializing. It's a friendly place. Supposedly down in the valley are the burnt-out vehicles of our economic labor company. A few days ago, the partisans, to the number of 400 men, passed through. You can't look into other people's souls. But what does it matter? Sheaves of grain crops are stacked in front of the house. A herd of cows trotted down the valley toward the setting sun. A cloud of yellow dust covered them. From the houses on the slopes, women and children come out and call to them with ringing shouts. We have washed ourselves. We feel good. We are satisfied. September 4, 1943. We drive on a big road crossing valleys and hills, straight as a legionnaire's road. From afar, we could see clouds of dust billowing, shrouding like a sheep the road in the open, forestless terrain. The going was so easy for us that I pulled out my guitar. We followed the road with songs behind the cars that pulled out ahead, and we sang as we walked through the meadow along the riverbank where our road turned off. It must have surprised people. The last battery had just passed the bridge when a squadron of fighter bombers made a circle and swooped down on the narrow passage that ran down to the river. As they flew over, they fired machine gun bursts at us. There were only minor casualties and little damage to the batteries, but at such times it is almost impossible to hold the horses. In the afternoon we reached Shukov, our battle area. When we went to our temporary headquarters, the sun was setting in a golden haze. The golden background of the Gothic altar, an artist's creation could hardly compare with the glow of the horizon, with the tall fir trees in the foreground, or with the light that floated like smoke around the villages and forests. When I arrived with Wolf and I am Brown at the airfield, the infantry were stretched out in line, ready to attack. We joined them. We passed through the landing field. The enemy had entrenched themselves in shrubbery and in folds of terrain on the edge. We moved out quickly and occupied several single trenches and funnels around the perimeter. From there we could observe the low ground far ahead. Two hundred yards ahead, we could see the smoke from a mortar that continued to fire at us, and we spotted enemy infantry shelling our neighbors on the left. They were entrenched in two deep anti-tank ditches. I suppressed the fire of an entire battery. The enemy withdrew to the village, setting fire to houses and haystacks, thus covering the withdrawal. Radio communication worked perfectly. Franz and Ian were running behind me from foxhole to foxhole with antenna pins in their hands, headphones around their necks, Morse keys in their pockets. We occupied three islands of brushwood and part of the first anti-tank ditch. The enemy left the ditch only when his flank was attacked by the battalion on our right. We had captured the second ditch and the edge of the village and were now hidden by smoke. Here the attacking units clashed, drawn by the desperate resistance of the Russian infantry. Some of the Russians fought dressed in the trophy uniforms of German artillerymen. I was lying on top of a dugout reeling behind which the commander of one of the attacking units had seized the shelter of an anti-aircraft gun. Hidden by smoke, I tried to locate the damned, insolent man. The enemy artillery became more active, field guns, and Katyusha's opened heavy fire. In the dugout below me a child was crying. We advanced further than the task of the day determined. We dispersed the enemy units and returned to a pre-prepared position on an elevated perimeter. Meanwhile, the enemy had deployed their guns. We crawled on our bellies again. Franz and Ian were grumbling, complaining that their backs were blackened and blue from the constant pressure of the equipment. The infantry entrenched themselves in the airfield. Evening was approaching. I had to organize a fire screen, and our anode battery sat down. The Russians launched a counterattack, but were pinned down by our fire. We joined the corrector and took turns transmitting his data, using the same auxiliary equipment. I put up a fire screen by means of light signals. Only then could we, exhausted, think of finding some shelter, and of the fact that for the last two hours our provisions and our blankets had been waiting for us somewhere behind us in the woods. We found a narrow bomb silo shaft and crawled in, along with the adjusters and a few infantrymen. The moon rose as from a steady red ball. 
Franz and Ian walked almost three kilometers across the airfield to see how our wagon was doing. It was almost midnight when they returned crashing through barbed wire and craters of rocks and piles of bombs. In between fighting we found a stove, bent some pipes to connect to it, and built a fire. The silver moon was slightly in a haze. There was frost on the ground and empty single infantry trenches, but we had fire. Bullets whistled in the field, but we had three meters of ground over our heads. Our horse stood behind cover. Ian gave her a crate of fodder to keep her head down. At the beginning of the fourth, the order came to change position. At 3.45 we marched back. It was still dark. Again we scouted our way between piles of rocks and wire fences and shards of broken concrete. We saw dead men in the brush, fallen horses and broken vehicles on the road, piles of mangled equipment. Our mouths were dry from smoking and fatigue. Between the walls, and through the broken windows of shell-shocked buildings we could see the fiery red morning sky. It turned yellow. It was raining. When it, gray, hung low, and the ground was as if wrapped in a cold compress, we gave up. The roads were like a viscous oatmeal porridge. The grass was covered with white hoarfrost. Some fields still showed potato holm, brown and shriveled. We were soaked to the skin, dirty and tired when we found shelter in a few houses in Meli Solip. Tomorrow we are going to move into position. According to the Wehrmacht communique, the enemy began the expected offensive on Yelnya. Three cavalry regiments became divisions. I am sitting on a straw mattress in the open air waiting for the order to move out on a communications task. Infantry gun shells whistle through the heights from the east. Four tanks break through the railroad to the north. The shells of the 11th battery slowly approach them until flashes from the barrels of their guns color red the puffs of smoke from the bursting shells. The tanks clumsily turn back. We move forward and climb the slopes toward the railroad. Tanks and anti-tank guns are firing at individual soldiers. We lie down for a long time, taking cover behind a small slope and figure out a way from bush to bush. The bushes are scattered at some distance from each other. Our silhouettes stand out clearly on the ridge. It is a clear warm day of late summer. Buckwheat fields glisten in the sun with rusty red color. In the distance, another village is burning on the enemy's battle line. We descend into the valley of a small river, where we find a telephone line stretching toward the enemy. Soon, we are already munching the day's portion of bread, laid out for the infantrymen to the sound of high-pitched machine gun bursts, to the howling of rapidly flying shells and heavy brats with a deafening thudding bass that shake the ground. The powder smoke came in lazy waves. At last we reach Lieutenant Ilner. He sits by the river and washes his feet. Eight days have passed since I last took off my boots. It's a pleasant moment of peace. At 17.30 we receive the order over the radio. Retreat immediately. At 18.30 Ian Brown was waiting for us at the edge of the village. He led the horse out of the low ground where he had tied it earlier. Half an hour later, we were in the village in an artillery position. The batteries were ready to go. The headquarters had already withdrawn. Ahead all around, the sky was red. It was almost night. A girl looked out of the window. She recognized me. I was looking for quarters for the battery personnel at the time. Don't go, she said softly. Oh, Panenka, what do you know about war? Wren was already saddled. We rode behind the battery, catching up with the dark columns. The heavy binoculars clanked with a clang on the buckle of my belt. We leveled off with the battery. We're marching. It's cold. Midnight is coming. The moon floats through silvery clouds. Parachute flares shine brightly like constellations. Somewhere bombs are whistling. I take out my guitar. Do you know how many stars there are in the sky? Chew, that it's coming from up there to us. Franz looks pale and sickly, with deep furrows around his mouth and eyes. He has a fever. I feel like I've had the air pumped out of my stomach and swallowed salt water. I've only eaten a piece of bread since noon. The wagon's on its side, all muddy. Never mind. 
It doesn't matter. It's still too cold to eat when we're on the road. Let's sing another song, smoke another cigarette, then we won't feel hunger so much. Slowly everyone fell asleep right in the vans and in the saddles. Von R. has to wake up the truck driver snoring behind the wheel. Leaving behind four kilometers of the road, the column came to a standstill. At 4.00 we arrived at our camping quarters. Two days later, Helmut Pabst was killed in action. Last Will Russia, April 17, 1942 Dear parents, My only concern is one thing, how can I ease your pain? What could I do to soften the blow that no longer bothers me, but only you? I will gather all my strength to try to exhort you. My life is not fully lived, but it is complete. It is filled with your love, and it has been so fulfilling that I can only thank you over and over again, even though the other life in which I intended to do my thing as if it's a man has barely begun. That first life is fully completed and brought to completion, the one that you, my father and my mother, gave me and protected. I love you so much. If you want to put a small memorial in my honor in the garden, let it not be a beautiful gesture or something memorializing grief. It can be a young boy with a shy smile, radiating harmony and peace, or it can be a young man who has rested in peace with himself, so that my heart can become attached to him, not turning away from the world, but open to all that is beautiful. Farewell. I loved you so much.